I brought a pie to the recording session today. Okay. Do I get to eat it? Of course. Of course. When we finish recording this show, we're going to have some cherry pie. I have to wait till the end? Well, no, there's no reason to wait till the well, end. It's like two hours away. We'd have a lot of talking to we'll do. We'll do 45 minutes, and then I'm leaving whether or not you're <laughs> done talking or not. You'll just hear like the, the, the cartoon sounds of like the Roadrunner, just you meet me being on here. you see a Jeff-shaped hole, a hole in the in side the of my house Little as I Kool-Aid leave. man. Yes, as I go back inside. <laughs> little Back to the Future trail on the ground. Well, I think we need to do a longer ver- a director's cut of this show. It's just five hours. Right. I'm not coming to the recording of it. <laughs> I don't even have a baseball game or a basketball game that I have to be at. I'm still not staying longer than 45 minutes. Quiet, please. I literally have nothing else to do. I just don't want to be here any longer. I am done at 45 minutes. Well, four, uh, we should start then. Three. Except to maybe have some pie. Two. <laughs> Company presents a truly terrible podcast. Welcome to Nonsense Season 2, Episode 10. I'm Jeff Parker. I'm Jay Little. This is our take on the week's business tech and entertainment headlines. This time, we'll look at supersonic travel. By train. Oh, that's cool. It's Pi Day. The value of Pi was first calculated by Archimedes of Syracuse, one of the greatest mathematicians of the ancient world. I had no idea he was from Syracuse. You see the sweatshirt. Yeah, he would wear the sweatshirt, but I just assumed he was a fan. I know he was actually from Syracuse. Always talk down Boston. Now, uh, here's the thing most people do. That's funny. Here's the thing that most people don't know about Archimedes. He first approximated pi at four. <laughs> Just four. He can't stretch out all those digits. Who knew? Yeah, he had a deadline. His publisher was trying to get it out the door, and they were yelling at him, and he was like, fuck, is it three or is it four? I don't know. And he went with four, and he was wrong. <laughs> it was first named after the Greek letter by William Outred in his works dating back to 1647 and was later embraced by the scientific community when Leonard Euler used the symbol in 1737. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Before it was called pi, it was called something else? It was just called that 3.1. <laughs> four number which was really awkward to say it had a nice ring to it give me that 3.14 number for calculating i need to i got a circle like just give me the thing i'm very pleased we've made a euler reference on this show i know my one of my uh favorite professors of all time was a big fan of euler and he brought him up damn near every talk all right so how did pi day end up becoming a countrywide phenomenon cut to san francisco's exploratorium in 1988 or was thought up by physicist larry shaw shaw linked march 14th with the first digits of pi 3.14 and offered fruit pie and teas to everyone starting at 1.59 p.m., the next three digits of the value. Cute. A few years later, Larry's daughter, Sarah, remarked that the special day was also the birthday of Albert Einstein, and they started celebrating the life of the world-famous scientist as well. Pi Day became an annual exploratorium tradition that still goes on today. It didn't take long for the idea to spread, and on March 12, 2009, the U.S. Congress declared it a national holiday. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was a national holiday. Why would they declare that on March 12th? Yeah, <laughs> to- Two days before. Were they not paying attention? No, what, the, what? the guy who sponsored the bill in Congress was from Indiana. So they were like, <laughs> he got the idea just, on the second. He was like, 3.2? Yeah, this should be pie day. around it close enough. And then they negotiated and they decided 3.12 was close enough. How is your week going? Uh, my week is excellent. I spent, I, I didn't realize that it was pie day. Yeah. Because I just don't, I mean, I know 3.14, I'm not a complete and utter idiot. But I, I thought it was meat day. So I made uh, a lot of meat. I had some friends in town from out of state. I made 25 pounds of- Holy um, cow. Yeah, of beef ribs, which is basically enough for me and one person to watch me. And then... uh <laughs> 14 pounds of carnitas. My first time wow. making carnitas, so I'm, I'm very uh, very excited. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. How about you? How's your week been going? Pretty good. I drove my kid to school for likely the very last time this morning. Oh, end of the end of the year is coming up, huh? The end of the year is coming up. I wouldn't be driving him now because he sure. drives himself to school, except he tore his ACL. Yeah. And so he had surgery. Uh-huh. He has not been able to drive yet. Tomorrow, he's probably going to be fine driving. And sure. It's amazing how fast that heals after they do the surgery. Well, yeah. When you're under 20, everything heals fast. Well, the first time when I thought it was the last time I was going to drive him to school when he got his license, sure. I didn't really have that moment where I really sure. thought about, wow, this is kind of a landmark thing. This morning I was like, oh, this is this is probably the last time. Did you, uh, like when he was walking away from the car, did you like honk the horn a whole bunch and be like, no. bye, <laughs> bye, <laughs> see you later, just to embarrass the shit no, out of him? No, but I did just kind of stay there and watched him walk yeah. away and kind of like, have that know, moment. just put that moment into my head. It's so funny you say this because what I probably should have said for my week is my son had his first performance in, he's in kindergarten and it was the, the little engine and I uh, he was the conductor. He did a great job. And what was fun about that is I got to drive him to school, drop him off, put everybody into my truck. So I had my my brothers in town. My father is here. My mother-in-law. Uh, we all got into the truck with the kids and my wife, drove to school and got to drop them off. The best part is because he sits in the third row of the truck, I had him get out the back 
So we're at drop off. They don't like you get out of the car at drop off. Sure. And the, the poor teacher's looking at me. She doesn't know me. She, she sees me. I was like, hey, he's get out the back. So she goes to the back door. I'm like, no, no, the back. <laughs> I go to the back. <laughs> he just climbs out the back. Yeah, yeah. It's like a clown car. It's just full of people in my giant truck. It is really fun dropping them off. The shit show of picking up is not fun because it's a line, 30 minute wait, and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. But I know I'm going to miss these days when they're gone. So we should probably at some point get to our headlines. Yeah, I think it's worth it. The House has passed a bill that could ban TikTok in the U.S. The House passed legislation that could ban TikTok in the U.S. unless the app parts ways with Chinese parent company ByteDance. It's a major challenge to one of the world's most popular social media platforms used supposedly by 170 million Americans. Do you think it's actually 170 million Americans? I I do. I do. Everyone I know, literally everyone I know that is under the age of 60, not only has TikTok, but is on it at least a couple times a day. Really? Everyone is on TikTok. Everyone. People get their, their news, like their daily, what's going on in the world they get from TikTok. Have I not sent you the TikTok live stream of just the hamsters running in the wheels set to like dance music? I think you have. I think you have. I could yes. spend all fucking day just staring at that. I don't know why. Well, as a citizen of the United States, I do care that we're not just banning things because we can. I mean, I think this is, sure. we really want to think through the implications of this. I agree with you on the implication side for sure. The, the idea of a ban is really fascinating to me. What are you going to do? You're going to put up like a great firewall? Like, how are you going to ban this? How are you going to make it's this? It's interesting how they're going to ban it. They're, they're not banning it from web browsers as far as I know. Yeah. They are banning it from app stores. They'll ban it from the two app stores. Yeah. Because they'll say, this is an enemy of the state. You cannot carry their app in your app store. Sure. And boom, that's it. Google and Apple have to take it out of their app store. I got three letters for you. What's that? Just fucking make it a PWA. The bill passed on a bipartisan uh, vote of 352 votes to 65 against. Sure. And it gives TikTok about five months to separate from ByteDance. Yeah, I love the arbitrary time period. Separate from the technical issues of this and separate from whether or not I think it's a good idea or a bad idea, it does seem like if you want to put a ban on TikTok in place in an election year, you better hope the people voting for you are young because I think you're going to piss off a whole bunch of young people, meaning like sub 60, and they're going to be grumpy about this is my hunch. TikTok actually put out a push notification and it said Congress is planning a total ban of TikTok. Speak up now. I got it because I'm on TikTok. Yeah. Before your government strips 170 million Americans yep. of their constitutional right to free expression. Well, they're not really stripping you of your constitutional right free expression. Sure. Lots of places you can express yourself. They're just banning TikTok. Yeah. It was kind of interesting. They sent that push notification out. Tons of people called their congressional yeah. representatives. Uh, by the way, doesn't that prove the point? That they can influence government? Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. The CCP is just like, <laughs> you know, whatever. Whatever you tell them to do, they're going to go do. Well, the most aggressive and threatening calls didn't come from kids. They came from adult women. Interesting. That's what all those uh, uh, congressional offices were saying. But still, the point is they can push out to 170 million people directly. They have direct conversations with 170 million people. Who else has that? Anybody who's got a, an app the scale of TikTok. Who is that, though? There's, they're all U.S. It's companies. It's Apple. It's Google. They yep. can both yep. do it. U.S., U.S. It's probably Facebook. Amazon. I would guess Facebook. It's X. Yep. Literally, you could call those companies gatekeepers, I think, if I were to come up with a name off the top of my head. It is kind of fascinating, though, and, and maybe this is what you're getting at. The juxtaposition between in the states were like, ah, this one, bad. Let's set this one aside and deal with it separately. Versus the EU, where they're like, you're all fucking bad. Here's the rules you need to play by. Yeah. And I got to say, there's something to that. But I, then I also wonder, if you look at the EU, look at the what they define gatekeepers as, right? In the DMA. Yeah. How many of those companies are in the EU, meaning they're EU-based companies? Zero. Zero. You know, they're they're all either US companies or the one that's a, a, a Chinese company, TikTok, ByteDance. It's kind of an interesting perspective. Like, is that protectionism? Is that why the US isn't doing something that's that's more broad because the majority of them are US companies? Well, this may be protectionism, plain and simple. Think about how this benefits Meta and Snap. Yeah. This is huge, huge for Meta and Snap. President Biden has already said he will sign this bill if it comes to his desk. Yeah, sure. It has yeah. to pass the Senate now. And I'd give it at least a 25% chance of passing the you, Senate. You say it's huge for, for Snap and, and Meta. I don't actually think that's true because, first of all, I don't think TikTok is going anywhere. If this ban is becomes a real thing, they will find someone to sell it to. It's not going to go away. They're not going to kill that, that golden goose. They're never going to sell the app and the algorithm. They're never going to sell the entire thing to a, a new entity, a different entity. You would not kill the golden goose. If their choice is is shut down U.S. users, 170 million people. That's not going to be their choice. What's their choice going to be? Their choice is going to be, all right, you're going to shut down ByteDance? Guess what? We're going to shut down Apple and Tesla. Guess what? You sell a lot of stuff in our country. Bye. Oh, interesting. And that's going to be the end of that. I don't see that happening. Okay, why? You're going to have backlash from TikTok users in the U.S. if they lose access to TikTok, for sure. For sure. However, the backlash you're going to get from Chinese users losing access to Apple devices, I think would be much, much bigger. It's a tiny amount of people who use Apple devices in China. If you look at it, 
It's mostly Android devices. China can just say just as easily, buy Apple, buy Tesla. I don't like the idea of, of this ban. I don't like the way that it's being enacted. I don't know what's better. I do think something should be done on this. I think, but by the way, this is going to be a bigger problem as time goes on. You're going to have more foreign national companies that have direct access to U.S. consumers. This like sure. ByteDance just happens to be the first one that's done it right and well, but you're going to have more of that. And I don't know what the answer is. It can't always be in the U.S. I still don't get even what the problem is. They're worried about ByteDance giving their data to the CCP. Who cares? What data does the CCP want? So June in Montana can do the floss dance perfectly. What is it that they're getting? You as a non-TikTok user, you think you just go there to watch people doing the floss dance. It's not <laughs> that, right? It's really everything. They've got a shopping store now, right? That's all integrated into TikTok. A shopping store. Just I shouldn't a shopping store. Jesus Christ, am I a dinosaur? I just like the name shopping store. Am yeah. I a fucking dinosaur? <laughs> On their goddamn, their little light boxy phones, they can just buy shoes. <laughs> they got a shopping store. I've become all the things I used to make fun of. I literally am just like it's spit off my happen, lawn. Dude. I really thought I could wait. I thought I was going to be able to resist longer, but I'm a little shopping store. When I, I start shopping calling, store. when I start referring to things as e-commerce, I want you to shoot me, okay? I just want you to just stop recording, maim me fatally, because there was one word I've always had, which is e- I'm like, it's fucking electronic commerce. When was the last time you had commerce that wasn't electronic? Like, when, right. like the 50s? What are we talking about? Like When the mag strip came in on the credit card, yeah, we started right? electronic. That's literally exactly. the dawn literally. of electronic commerce. Yeah. So I feel like everything since then, like even cash becomes if we go back to raised letters. We're off e-commerce. <laughs> All right. So you were saying it involves a lot of people as a shopping component to it. I didn't know this. I didn't know you had a yeah. shopping component to TikTok. Oh, dude, it's massive. What do you buy? What do you buy? I would, what do you you get? should today, when we're done recording, you should go like spend an hour on TikTok. It's never going to happen. Why not? Why wouldn't you? Because <laughs> I don't have an hour of my life to give to TikTok. Ban it. Don't ban it. I don't care. I don't want to hear any more stories about I'm gonna it. I'm going to find you an hour in your day. Here's how. Instead of us making this a two and a half hour episode like we normally do, how about we just I'm make it like a 45 minute? I'm not doing a two and a half hour episode. Have we discussed this? Have we gone over this? <laughs> no, I don't think so. They're 45 minutes. So fill me in. What exactly? Yeah. They're shopping. What's the data anyone's going to care about? And why does anybody in China care that I buy an air fryer? Okay. First Are of all. Are they going to start feeding me ads for, you know, their kinds of air fryers? I mean, you've got direct access to half of the country. But so what? They put a push no- notification you, out. You can control the content that they see. I'm just not getting what the data is. I'm not getting the fear of influence because par- partially because it hasn't happened, at least as far as I know, it hasn't happened yet. We haven't seen TikTok try to influence anybody politically. And yet Facebook, we've seen it all over the place and we don't seem to have any problem with that. Yeah. What data does ByteDance hold that anyone cares about? Man. I can buy ad data from Amazon. I can buy data from Facebook. It's effortless to get this, this kind of all, data. That's what this is. You figured it out. This is all just an end run to get them to pay for it. Like, we don't care if you have it. We just want you to have it for free. You just got to buy it. Like, basically, the U.S. the U.S. sent them a link to buy the data with, like, an affiliate code so that the U.S. government gets a 10% affiliate share. They're like, no, 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 no. We don't care about the data. The data you can have. Yeah, we're great. We just want you to buy it. Okay, and over the headlines, or headline, up next, headline. we're going to talk about flying the friendly skies. Flying those friendly skies, like, really fucking fast, like Mach 2. Fast. Oh, that's cool. Let's do it. Mach 2, the number, not, not T-O-O. Mach 2. When you think of commercial jets, what do you think of as the most beautiful or elegant jetliners ever made? Yeah, I, I don't have a beautiful plane. It, it, to me, it's all about the service. Okay, but there's no no external planes that you've ever found more enjoyable aesthetically than others. No. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> what? Like, what do you mean? What are you What are you thinking of? Well, I was thinking we would do a segment, but now I'm thinking maybe we'll just have some dead air that will run. How does that sound? <laughs> we'll just do 45 minutes of dead air. Like, there's usually a lot of planes that people will hearken back to, a, a like, the elegance of the sky. The 747 comes to mind a lot, right? Yeah, of course, of course. It's a very iconic look. When I was a kid, you'd get on the 747, there would be a piano bar upstairs. <laughs> You got on a different 747 than me, which actually, you know what? Now that I think about it, I don't think I've ever actually flown on the 747. They're long gone. They are long gone. I don't think they're any in service. Um, I think the first time I went to Australia 20 years ago, I had to choose between the 747 on Qantas or I don't remember, but I don't think I've ever been on a 747 now that I think about it, which makes me extremely sad. 737, you've been on a million times. Yeah. Yeah. Usually I'm holding the fucking panels together with my hands, <laughs> holding the tire on. Um, anyway, so usually there's a handful of planes that come to mind and people think about about sexy aircraft you're gonna say the concord the concord the concord is the one i was looking for i don't think the concord was sexy it had really? a weird front end no everybody says that though 
Well, and so you're not alone. It's me that's the oddball. Here. Yes, of course. But it, now I have to know what what planes do you think are sexy if you don't think the Concord is sexy? Are you just like Wright Brothers, like just going? Oh yeah, well, sure. I'd da Vinci, the like the weird Da Vinci flappy <laughs> thing. Like is that where you go back to? <laughs> I don't understand. I mean, Rule Thirty Four. I'm fine if you find that attractive, but I planes really... are kind of utilitarian shaped. Even even private planes. See, this is but there's just nothing about this that I go, ooh, that's a yeah. uh, you know what a great vehicle. You feel the same way about cars, though, right? So like, are all mechanisms of transportation like even boats like do you ever look at a yacht and go wow that's a sexy yacht or you just go no they're no. all they're all just yeah, boats. They're boats interesting some of them have uh you know bottom floor theaters movie theaters <laughs> yes some of them have bottom floor nice. bowling alleys but the yes, problem is yes. they only have two lanes so i don't know how you would ever survive with only two <laughs> lanes of bowling when you're out in the water many folks let me rephrase that 50 percent of the nonsense hosts i think the concord <laughs> is a spectacularly sexy plane <laughs> So the ratio ain't great when it comes to nonsense. The Concorde is commonly considered a beautiful plane. It was also the first supersonic commercial airline. It had a weird nose. It, it, was, okay. it was strange. Oh, okay. okay, look, she's retired now. Can we please be kind to her? <laughs> Can you not? Just, do you remember about when they entered service? Roughly speaking. I'd be in the 60s. Good guess. That was kind of my guess, too. It's actually the 70s, mid-70s, 1976. Oh, really? Exactly. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you and I were both both certainly off on that. Uh, when do you think ideation and development started? If it went into service in 76, yeah. when do you think they started working on this plane? Like the idea got, of it. Well, got to be in the 70s. Well, I'm glad you didn't say the 80s. <laughs> I'm really glad you didn't say the fucking 80s. I do feel like I'm winning here today. Um, this surprised me. The sort of the ideation or, or the initial design of this thing, the sure, kind of conception sure. of it, started in 1954. Oh my goodness. Right? Isn't that nuts to me? Well, I was kidding when I said the 70s. I was thinking the 60s. Sure. I was not thinking the 50s. I mean, 1954, you're talking about like, you know, not even a decade after the end of World War II. Yeah. They're thinking about supersonic transport, which is what this program is commonly referred to, the SST. And this was um, Sud Aviation, which later became Aerospatial, the French plane, you know, French government sponsored plane manufacturing and the yeah. British Aircraft Corporation. They started these studies in the mid 50s. What's kind of crazy about this is it ended up taking France and the UK signing a treaty. They signed a fucking treaty, not like a commercial contract, mm -hmm. a treaty establishing the development project. And this is in like uh, November of 62. And they sort of defined the program cost to be like 70 million pounds, which is the equivalent of roughly 1.4 billion pounds in, in 2021 dollars. Uh, they constructed six prototypes beginning in, in the mid 60s, in, uh, February of 65 and the first flight took off in March of 1969. Six prototypes. Yeah, I'll wait to wait to hear this. This is you're going to love this. This is nuts. But I, I wanted wanted to first start with the name. Do you have any idea where the name came from? The grapes. The grapes. Yep, it's the grapes. They were initially the Concord going, grapes. Yeah, that's that is exactly where it came from. They're initially going to call it the Welsh plane, Welsh's <laughs> or jelly. No, not the grapes. I always wondered about this. I never bothered enough to look it up, but I always thought it was because it's kind of a unique name. Yeah. It was at Charles de Gaulle's January 1963 press conference. Conference, right where, where the aircraft was first called the Concorde and where the name came from was uh, a suggestion by an, the at the time 18 year old son of F.G. Clark so he was the publicity manager at the the BAC the, the British Aircraft Corporation's plant uh, the Filton plant and it, his belief was that it reflected the treaty between the British and the French governments that led to the Concorde's construction the name Concorde is from the French word which has an English equivalent also Concorde without an E so the, the French version has an E at the end the, the English version does not mm -hmm. both words mean agreement or harmony or union, which I thought was oh, really okay. cool, right? So okay. you have yeah. this treaty that you established to, to build this plane together and they literally named it agreement which is kind of cool. That's nice. So when they initially named it, right, this is in, in uh, 63, it was Concorde with an E, the French version, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. this was this was the, the start. The name was officially changed to Concorde by Harold Macmillan in response to a perceived slight by Charles de Gaulle. And at the French rollout in late 1967, the British government minister of technology, this guy Tony Benn, announced that he would change the spelling back to Concorde with an E. Mm -hmm. And this created a nationalist uproar in, in the UK. And it took... Right. It took Ben, the, the British government minister of technology, it took Ben stating, and I love this, that the suffix E represented excellence in England, in Europe, and in Tate. And the English bought that? <laughs> <laughs> they fucking bought it. Now listen, in his listen, it gets better. In his memoirs, Ben recounted a tale of a letter from an irate Scotsman claiming, "You talk about E for England, but part of it is made in Scotland." And uh, Scotland's contribution was the nose cone. They made the nose cone for the aircraft. Ben replied, well, "That explains a lot." Listen to this. Ben replied, "Oh, it was also E for Ecos, the French name for Scotland." Oh, okay. This guy was just good at <laughs> sales. Said, is what totally. he what he was. And he said, "And I might have added E for extravagance and an E for escalation as well." Fine. 
fine. Really, what he was doing was being nice to the French, this, but he didn't want to admit that. This fucker just ripped out the E section of the dictionary and just paged sure, through sure. it every day. And he's like, yeah, hey, you can be whatever you want, man. It's an E. I just thought that was really funny. The other thing about the name that is kind of fascinating, much like the freeways in Los Angeles, Concord acquired that unusual nomenclature, uh, but for an aircraft where in common usage in the UK, it's known as Concord without an article. So instead of the Concord or a Concord, oh, interesting. Interesting. it's just Concord. I flew Concord. Yeah. Not I flew a Concord. I flew the Concord. Not so much in the States, but to me, that's very much how we do freeways, right? Nobody calls 405, 405. We call it the 405. Because it's yeah. fucking 12 lanes each way and you never move. So the four, sure. you're going to spend your life on the 405. Anyway, I thought that was that was pretty interesting. All right. So why do we want to build this thing? What was the whole point, Jeff? Why, why do we want the Speedy Concord? travel. Zipping speedy travel. And we also like to really upset people with sonic booms and breaking their windows. <laughs> so you clearly read my notes. <laughs> I didn't. There's no notes to read. Fair. I just keep them from you. Okay. So yeah, the goal was to launch a, a safe supersonic commercial aircraft, right? One that could provide supersonic travel between London and New York in only three hours. Yeah. That was sort of the original intent of this this whole SSD program. Which is lovely. It did come with some drawbacks. We'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, the Concorde was intended to be a symbol of luxury travel, right? Offering exquisite service and shorter travel times. It was supposed to be mm-hmm. the best way to travel commercially. To achieve this, they knew a different type of commercial aircraft would be needed. And in the end, the Concorde was implemented as a tailless aircraft design with a narrow fuselage permitting only four breast seating for a sort of 92 to 120 passengers, depending on configuration. This Augival Delta Wing, so sort of this rounded Delta Wing, mm-hmm. which is, I think, part of what makes it so sexy. And then the Droop Nose for landing visibility, which yeah, I know it's sure. not the coolest looking thing. It kind of reminds me of that spy versus spy. It's weird. But it's pretty cool to see it work. Like, sure. <laughs> see it work. I get technically how it works. And that totally. is, it is cool that it works. It just doesn't, to me, it doesn't make the plane look better. It just makes me look like the plane is yeah. a little spent. And then it had, so it was powered by four engines, four Rolls Royce uh, uh, turbo jets uh, with variable engine intake ramps and reheat for takeoff and acceleration to supersonic speeds. So that, that reheat is the, the afterburner, basically. Balancing subsonic lift needs with supersonic drag reduction is not easy. So you need to be able to make enough lift when your subsonic speed, sort of what we would call regular flight speed. Sure. But that lift, you know, what gives you the lift at those lower speeds is also what gives you drag at supersonic speeds. So that's bad, right? You got to find that balance. Fascinating. So in the early 50s, when the director of the Royal Aircraft Establishment in the UK, uh, he asked to form a committee to study the supersonic transport, this SST concept. That group ultimately considered the concept of an SST infeasible and instead suggested continued low-level studies into supersonic aerodynamics. So initially they said, you can't do this. It's just not going to work. Shortly after though, these two German-born British scientists published a series of reports on a new wing platform known in the UK as the quote, slender delta concept. And this team worked with the fact that delta wings can produce strong vortices on their upper surfaces at high angles of attack. So what that means is you, you have to lean the plane back more, right? You need a higher angle of attack. Right, and then right. on the top of these delta wings, you get these little vortices. These vortices create a low pressure. That low pressure causes lift to be greatly increased. Uh-huh. Now, this effect had been noticed earlier, notably by Chuck Yeager in the Convair XF-92, but its qualities had not been fully appreciated. One of the scientists on this, Weber, had suggested that this was no mere curiosity and the effect could be used deliberately to improve low speed performance. That Hmm. one sort of brain flip is the thing that made the Concorde real. Because prior to this point, there was really no belief that a swept wing was going to work. Like they had looked at swept Mm -hmm. wing using a similar span to like regular wings, but it hadn't really, they hadn't put all the pieces together. What these two scientists figured out was that if you extended the delta wing along the length of the fuselage, you could maximize the amount of lift you would get it at lower speeds. And that was sort of the big breakthrough that that worked. And the, some, the folks in the room considered the true birth of the Concorde when they pitched this idea of a slender delta at a meeting where the initial RAA team members that were asked to explore the SST concept were also present. Like it was those folks being in the room at the same time, they're like, oh shit, we can do this. Yeah. So there were downsides to this, such as that they'd have a very nose high uh, takeoff and landing. Right, right. So you'd have to be, you know, this high angle of attack. Which, you can't which, see. Which you can't see, but also you need longer running gear your your landing gear needs to be longer right. because you have this this higher angle which i never really thought about so anyway so this this double delta shaped wing uh that the, the concord pioneered is what i think most people attribute when you go oh okay that's when you think concord you think of that but they brought several other firsts to commercial aircraft that i was completely unaware of before doing this segment it was the first airliner to have an analog fly-by-wire flight control which is pretty cool tell me what that is so fly-by-wire meaning you're flying electronically you're not you don't have like a cable or something or hydraulic 
analog system that you're controlling directly. You're controlling it. Um, now, it wasn't digital. It was analog, but it was still by, by electronics. Wire, by electronics yeah. 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 Um, of course, it could maintain a super cruise of up to Mach 2.04, which is roughly 1,300 miles per hour. Wow. And it did that at an altitude of 60,000 feet, which is also nuts to think about how high it was. That super cruise capability is worth talking about, too. So super cruise is when you have sustained supersonic flight without using an afterburner or what the British call reheat. Mm -hmm. Many supersonic military aircrafts are not capable of supercruise, and they can only sort of go above Mach 1 uh, with short bursts using their afterburners. The problem with afterburners is they're not efficient. So they're, it's like a great way to, you, but you're basically injecting fuel behind the engine sure. to also explode, right? To, to give you a- Batman had an afterburner on the Batmobile. Yes, of course he did. I, um, I used to have one on my Kia. Took it off. I, I always wanted one. <laughs> you could probably have one. In case somebody was tailgating me, I could just flip on my afterburner. True. There's there, a bunch of like, especially the old like muscle car guys, they will put spark plugs in their, their exhaust pipes towards the back. Of course they will. They'll turn them on because you get enough unburnt fuel that goes out the sure. back, especially when you of lift. Course, of you course. get these like five foot flames that shoot out <laughs> the back of your tailpipe. I think it's kind of comedy. It doesn't help push you forward. No. But it sure does look cool. The afterburning process, uh, as I was mentioning, it injects fuel into the combustor in the jet pipe behind the turbine. So it kind of re heats that exhaust gas and then, yeah. and then pushes you forward. So the Concorde was the first and still to this day, the only commercial airliner that could super cruise without afterburners, which you kind of had to do if you want to make it fuel efficient. And then of course it also, the other thing the Concorde brought us was the droop nose. It brought us the droop nose sure, sure. so that they could they could um, land the plane and still see the runway. That was some of the, the technology side. By the way, I think on the new supersonic, the, the boom supersonics, they're talking about landing just via video. I mean, that's the thing. You don't really need that visual much anymore. You put on some yeah. cameras, you make some redundancy. And so much of it's going to be done by computer anyway. I mean, I watched a commercial airliner land in literally no visibility. They could not see the runway. They're on the ground and you still can't see the runway on the cockpit camera. Sure. And they're just like, yep, done this every day. No problem. Not a problem, right? Crazy. Okay, so when the treaty was signed in November of 1962, this is between uh, France and the UK, the program cost was estimated at around 70 million pounds. So that's about 1.4 mm -hmm. million pounds in, in 2021. Prophetically, the uh, UK Treasury Min Ministry presented a very negative view, suggesting that there was no way the project would have any positive financial returns for the government, especially in light that, quote, the industry's past record of over-optimistic estimating suggests that it would be prudent to consider the cost to turn out much too low. Sure. They basically said, look, we're fucking bean counters, and we know these fuckers under, you know, underestimate every single time. They aren't pessimistic enough. Yeah, I look at it as an engineer and go, well, look, you got a lot of unknowns. You're just trying to go faster than the sound barrier. Who knows what else is going to come up? Tons of unknowns, yeah. This is hard. And sure enough, between delays and cost overruns, it increased the program cost from that initial 70 million pounds to uh, in in well that was in nineteen sixty two dollars to somewhere between one point five and two billion pounds by nineteen seventy six yeah right so sure it, sure sure it kind of went up a little over ten x. And the market was initially predicted at 350 aircraft. That's what they sort of thought they'd, they'd be able to sell. And the manufacturers received mm -hmm. over 100 option orders from many of the major airlines straight away. So a bunch of, of airlines were interested, but ultimately the Concorde had considerable difficulties that led to its utterly dismal sales performance. Costs had spiraled during development, as I mentioned. So yeah. unit costs by 1977 were 23 million pounds. That's about 150 million pounds in, in 2021 dollars. So 250-ish mm -hmm. million bucks, I think, is where they... You, you sort of think of that. The sonic boom made traveling supersonically over land impossible without causing complaints from citizens. And this thing made a pretty loud sonic boom. It wasn't sure. quiet. And then world events had also dampened the Concorde sales prospects. So uh, you had the 1973-74 stock market crash, the 73 oil crisis. Uh, airlines had become cautious about aircraft with high fuel consumption rates. And then you had new wide body aircraft like the Boeing 747 uh, had recently made subsonic aircraft significantly more efficient and presented a low risk option for airlines. Right. Also cheaper for, for passengers because you're flying so many passengers. Absolutely. Absolutely. So listen to this. While carrying a full load, Concorde achieved 15.8 passenger miles per gallon of fuel, which is kind of an interesting metric, right? So okay. you're kind of performing slightly better than a car yeah. at the time. Now, the Boeing 707 yeah. reached 33.3 passenger miles per gallon. The Boeing 747 was 46.4 passenger miles per gallon. That's a big difference. And the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 was doing 53 passenger miles per gallon. Yeah. So relative to the other options at the time, it was terrible, right, from a, from a cost perspective perspective. But you were you're trading that for for time, and then at, but at the time you had this emerging trend in the industry to favor cheap airline tickets, and and that caused uh, like Qantas to question Concorde's market sustainability because because Qantas had, had ordered some, but they, that it ultimately never took delivery on those. Sure. So how many do you think they ended up shipping? They were, they, they estimated the market at three hundred and seven. It's like playing this game with my wife. I fucking hate it. Just fucking hate it. <laughs> <laughs> you two, just do your own goddamn show. Let me play my stupid game. 
They estimated the market at three fifty, and we're going to play prices right rules. You yeah. need to guess a number without going over, and okay. your answer is seven. Is that it's only use? So you should just guess one, and you know you're going to be right. Yeah, you right, you're mistake. right. You're right. You've I got made a mistake. Room. Six that you could you could be wrong. No, they did not ship seven, Jeffrey. In total, they made twenty. Oh, I knew it was. I knew it was a two small were, number. I knew it was really low. low. Yeah, really low. So two were prototypes. Two were what they called pre-production aircraft. I thought you said they made six prototypes. Uh, they made six ones initially. Oh, that right. were like figuring out the bugs. So those were the ones that like they ordered that you had from. I don't think I don't think BA technically ordered. I think BAC ordered them. And they're like, mm-hmm. your BA, you're going to fly these. But it was twenty in total. Two prototypes, two pre-production aircraft, and then sixteen production aircraft. That's that's how it, gotcha. in the end they ended up gotcha. making these. Now, interestingly, most of those are on display all around the world, mostly in Europe. Uh, there's a couple here in the U.S. There's one at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Virginia. Mm-hmm. There's uh, one at the Intrepid Museum in New York. And then there's one, and I did not know this one, there's one at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. I had no idea Seattle got one too. So they are around in the U.S. if you want to go see one. And then uh, one was scrapped, a couple are in storage, and of course one was destroyed in the only Concorde crash back in uh, July of 2000. So most of them are still around and you can see them. Yes. Competition. Do you remember any competitors for the Concorde? No. There is one that is notable that a lot of people don't talk about that I think is really interesting to touch on for a second. It was the only true competitor of the Concorde, and it was the Tupolev Tu-144. That was a Russian-made aircraft. Uh, it carried passengers from November 1977 until a crash in May of 1978. So it only carried passengers for like okay. six months. Yeah. It conducted 102 commercial flights, 55 carried passengers. It uh, had a service altitude of about 52,000 feet, so just below um, uh, the, the Concorde, sure. but it cruised at a little bit faster. So it was at Mach 2, a little over Mach 2. It cruised slightly faster. But it was the first supersonic jet, right? I mean, it went supersonic in June of 1969, four months before the, the Concorde made its flight. And then in May 1970, it became the world's first commercial transport to exceed Mach 2. Yeah. So they beat us, right? The, 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 the Russians beat, I shouldn't say us, the Russians beat the, the European... Everybody. Yeah. You need to combine two things. You need to combine yeah. Mach 2 and you're in control of the aircraft also. And not fucking crashing. Yeah. Sure. yeah I, hope, I hope somebody at Boeing is listening to this particular episode. <laughs> yeah. So they had reliability development issues, as you were just mentioning. And they had a, a crash at the 1973 Paris Air Show. Um, you had fuel prices going up. It, the thing just just bombed. It, it After being removed from passenger service in 1978, the remaining TU-144s flew commercial cargo until 1983. I don't know why you need to fly cargo. I was going to say, of all things, why why does cargo <laughs> care how fast it arrives? Exactly. That seems insane to me. I think they just had them and they're like, well, I might as well fucking use them. Yeah. They later used it to train pilots of the uh, the Buran spacecraft. This was the, the Soviet um, sort of version of the NASA space program. And then NASA actually used it for supersonic research until 1999, which I had no idea. But it made its final flight in June of 1999, and the surviving aircraft were put on display across the former Soviet Union or into storage. Interestingly, there's only one Tu-144 that's on display outside of the former Soviet Union, and it was acquired and shipped, not flown, into Germany in 2001, uh, where it still stands. It's got, they put the original uh, Aerofloat livery on it, but here's what's super cool. It's on display next to an Air France uh, Concorde. Oh, that's really cool. So you see both of it's them. It's the only place in the world where you can see them both side by side. That's really cool. And it's pretty nuts. When you look at them, you go, there is no way these things were developed independently yeah. because they look a lot strikingly of similar, similar. similar there, ideas. There are pretty big differences. I do wonder how much of the this information design was leaked, uh, especially back then, right? Cold War days. As an interesting aside, before this partnership was formed between the UK and France, they were both working on SST programs independently. When they finally were like, hey, let's get together and talk and see, they were surprised to find they both came to the same sort of conclusion on design, yeah. quote, independently. And they're like, huh, we kind of got to the same place. Must be the physics. And then it came out later that it was fucking leaked from the UK government. Or it must be the information we're stealing from each other. It was leaked from the UK to France. One or the other. And they're like, oh yeah, we ended up with the same thing. Of course, it must be right. Anyway, so that was the T-144. There was a potential competitor in the US, the Boeing uh, 2707, but it was canceled in 1971 before a prototype could even be built. Sure. What's funny is when I read some of this history about the the SST program in the UK and in France. Let me let me just, yeah, yeah. you're saying SST, SST, not SSD. No, SST. Sorry, no, SSDs are what are in your, your yeah. MacBook. I want to just make sure SS, SSD, right, SSD is for... Super a piece of memory yes. for your computer. SST is supersonic travel. Supersonic transport, specifically the transport. The okay, thing that much fancier. Transport to, yeah. Unlike um, uh, the the fucking EU now that uses DMA to confuse yes. all us technologists. Uh, when they came out with SSDs, they put a D and not a T. So at least they are different letters. Now, so the Boeing twenty seven hundred seven was pretty cool because it was this designed by Boeing that they scrapped. They're like, this just isn't going to make sense. What's super interesting to me is when you read, as I've been reading through some of the history of the SST program in 
in the UK and in France, part of their inspiration for doing this was they're like, well, the Americans are going to fucking do it anyway. So we might as well come up with a, with a solution and be in the race. Right. But then ironically, they were the only ones, they were the only ones that came out with it, right? Had they not pushed on this, this would have never happened. You'd have never seen supersonic travel, at least not then. The Americans are pushing on it now. Well, yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 I was hoping to talk about that today. However, I don't think we have enough time in this episode. I want to talk a little bit more about the Concorde, yeah. but I think there's going to have to be a follow-up segment because there's some really cool stuff happening in, in uh, oh, supersonic uh, travel that's coming out. Absolutely remarkable. Yeah. stuff happened. Uh, okay, so do you know where this thing ended up flying? Where do you remember the Concorde flying from to? Heathrow to uh, JFK. Yep. What else? That's all I remember. I don't remember another route. So the only other one I, well, I, I do remember. Did it ever come out to LAX? I don't think it ever did. Ah, why couldn't it come to LAX? Well, I don't know, because you're flying over well, a lot of well, occupied you're space. You're sonic booming a whole lot of fucking people. Right. So you, to my knowledge, it never came to the West Coast. However, it did come to Dallas, and that was super interesting. So there was a, a this Dallas destination. It was like between 1978 and 1980. And do you remember Braniff? Remember Braniff International? Of course, yeah. of course, of course. So Braniff operated the segment from, Dal- from Dulles to Dallas. That's super confusing. That's fun to say. Yeah, right. And then uh, British Airways or Air France took over the European segment. So they would basically, okay. they would just take the aircraft from Dulles in Washington, D.C. and fly to Dallas subsonically. They would not fly it. They could not fly it supersonically and fly back. Sure. They canceled that because it was just not profitable. I don't know why the hell you do the same aircraft. Why not just fly them on a, another Some other aircraft, Subsonic right? some, plane. Some, yeah, it made no sense to me. Yeah. I knew about the the, G, the JFK flights, right? That's one everybody knows. I knew about the, the Dulles flights because there was a lot of traffic in and out of D.C. That was both from Paris and from... Mm-hmm from Heathrow. What I didn't know is that they, they from 84 until 1991, they flew three times a week from Dulles to Miami. Oh, wow. I had no idea they did that segment. Yeah. So you would fly into Dulles and then you could connect from Dulles to Miami. Again, why? Had enough people in Miami that wanted to pay a 15% premium to fly super fucking fast. <laughs> I don't know. But I mean, you could have you flown anything to get to Dulles. Oh, no, but no, Miami, I think they flew supersonically because they go over the water. Oh, really? I, th- oh, yeah, I okay. believe. I, I wasn't able to confirm that, but I'm pretty sure they flew it supersonically. You're flying out a little bit, maybe. Yeah. And then British Airways flew uh, a Barbados flight that flew for um, like from 1987 until I think retirement in 2003. So that was another very popular one. The Air France flights were totally different. I didn't know about any of these. Air France flew Paris to Rio de Janeiro via Dakar in 1976, which I had no idea. That's cool. They also flew, I mean, they flew to Dulles, they flew to DC. Can I interrupt with a question? Yeah, yeah. If you're flying at 60,000 feet, does that sonic boom actually reach the ground or is it diffused so, by the time it gets yeah, down? Yeah, so I, I really want to do a segment on um, sonic booms and I think I'm going to have to follow up this one with some some sonic boom coverage. So they're really fascinating. And this is where some of the work that they're doing now in, uh, in, in these sort of what we're calling the Concorde version two, depending on how you design the aircraft, you can minimize the level of the sonic boom. Mm-hmm. Roughly speaking, the, the size stripe of uh, the sonic boom on the ground is about a mile wide for every thousand feet you are up in the air. Okay, so it gets really wide if you get to 60,000 feet. So it feet. gets really yeah. wide. So you're at 60,000 feet, you're roughly speaking, you're about you're about a 60 mile wide stripe. And yes, it does diminish slightly as you get higher, but not enough to be noticeable, especially for the Concorde because it was so goddamn loud. Okay. I mean, it was okay. it was a super loud sonic boom. Yeah, um, it was. So yeah, so I thought that was interesting. I always wanted how wide that they call it the sonic carpet right or the boom carpet which i think is a great name and that boom carpet is about mm-hmm. anywhere between 30 to 60 miles wide depending on the level that it's flying at so it's not small even if you're over an unpopulated area that's a wide area of people that are going to hear a boom as they fly over right yeah. it's a lot of people who are going to scares your pets air france also flew paris to uh caracas venezuela uh via the azros that was in 1976 and then uh they operated choice weekly service to mexico city via dulles so i didn't know about any of those segments right they had a lot more segments than i thought no i didn't either <laughs> i did not not travel enough <laughs> not, in the not, 70s. Not on the Concorde. They also Apparently. flew a ton of charters. I had no idea you could charter. No. I, mean, I guess it makes sense if you think about you it. Charter, you anything, charter them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, BA and Air France each did 300 charters a year. Okay. And there were all sorts. So there was a regular charter in the UK from like 1998, uh, I think through 2000. They were short subsonic and supersonic experience flights. So you could just book a Concorde flight just to go supersonically, which I think is ridiculous. Yeah, just to say you did. In wintertime, during the 80s and 90s, they saw charter services to Lapland in Finland. And these were day trip experiences to visit Santa. That's cool. And some of these charters still run today. They're just not, they're just not on the Concorde. But how cool is that? Like you could, you'd fly the Concorde in, land on the, on the runway, just like when I took my kids on the train in uh, Williams, Arizona to go see Santa. You fly in and see Santa, then 
fly out, which is sure. kind of nuts because the other thing about the Concord is there's no APU on the Concord. <laughs> so you have to, when you ground start it, you need basically a giant fan to start the goddamn thing. So in Lapland, they got to have on the ground units in order to start this, this plane or it can't fly, which I just think is fascinating. There are charters to Australia and New Zealand. Right. Let's see. There's was, there was one I think it was flying between Christchurch and Sydney. Part of its rudder fell off, which is bad. Oh my gosh. You don't want to be down there when the rudder falls off. By the way, that flight to Australia, I think would, would be really useful. You would think. Because that's a really long flight. If you're going to go totally. supersonic speeds, that's where you want to go. Uh, now, I would like to say that I told you to say that now, but I, I didn't. So I'm really glad that you said that because the whole impetus for this article, it was that I had read they offered service. They actually ran service from Heathrow to Singapore. A big part of that was for Australian travelers. And they wanted, I mean, see, that's useful. Qantas had some of these on order. Yeah. They really wanted Concords to fly from Australia to um, to Europe. That was a big part of their sales plan for, for the Concord. I can endure a six hour flight, but a 15 hour flight, yeah. that, that's just, a, there's got to be a better way to do that. So looking at range in the late 70s, early 80s, the intent for this, this uh, Heathrow to Singapore service is that it would cut travel from about 18 hours on a subsonic aircraft with a layover to 10 hours. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at about a 15% increase in ticket price off a first class fare. Totally sounds worth you it. You know, going from 18 to 10 is a quite a big change. Now, Singapore Air was super interested in this, but these jets at the time had a, you know, Singapore $100 million price tag per jet. So it's about, you know, $250 million Singaporean dollars today. For Sing Air, they said that was just, quote, out of the question, that they could not, they could not afford to do that. But oh. they were keen to accept a lease if they if they could figure out a way to do a lease with, with the manufacturer. The pair of aircraft, they were intending to replace two Boeing 747s the airline had on option for delivery in 77 and 78. So they're going to swap out those two 747s for, for one or two Concords. About a year later, from their, when they started talking about this in November of 76, BA, British Airways, was negotiating with the, the Singapore government to start a London, Bahrain, Singapore service using the Concorde. The airline at that time was still blocked from flying jets into New York. So they couldn't even get the New York segment. They wanted to try to get the Singaporean segment on. Why were they blocked? In 76, they were still blocked from flying that segment because Congress wouldn't let you fly supersonically anywhere over the US. Okay. So they couldn't fly. They, they didn't start flying into New York until I think 77. And they were flying into Dulles just slightly before that. I think it was 76. They got approval to fly into Dulles. Mm-hmm. So at the time, they couldn't fly into the US. So they're looking at other alternatives. They wanted to fly into Singapore. Now, the Singaporean government, the Singaporean Airlines, they said, well, all right, we don't want you to do this by yourself. How about we lease 20 of the 100 seats on each of those flights because we're going to lose passengers, right? We know that they're, that first class passengers on Sing Air are going to want to fly on this segment. So we want to be a part of it, but we can't afford to buy the planes ourselves. Yeah. BA kind of had no choice. Like if BA wanted to do this, they had to do a deal with the Singaporean government in order to get into Singapore. So they said, okay, you know, fine, we'll play ball. And in the late 70s, though, like as they're figuring this out, India refused permission for the Concorde to fly over its airspace, blocking a direct route from Bahrain to Singapore, which is what BA wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So, of course, they have to negotiate. What BA or what the British government did was they put on the table more access to Heathrow slots for Air India. So they basically said, like, let's horse trade, right? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, they might as well yeah, get totally. something out of it. And, and Air India was, was into this. Ultimately, they agreed to a compromise with the Concorde flights from Bahrain to Singapore having to route around the Indian mainland, adding about 200 miles to the journey. So they did find a path. It wasn't what yeah. they wanted. It did add some length, but still you had a faster transit. Okay, so finally, the Singapore Airlines makes an agreement for this, this JV Concorde operation between British Airways and, and Sing Air in October of 77. And the inaugural service was planned for December 10th of that year. So so mid-December 1977. One-way fare was set to be about $4,200 Singaporean dollars, which is about 10,000-ish, 11,000 Singaporean dollars today from Singapore to London. Okay. How much is that in US dollars today? 7,500 bucks? I think that's about right. So roughly speaking, it's about 8,000 US dollars today, one way. Mm-hmm. BA said it needed to fill 60 out of the 100 seats on board to break even, but the capacity was capped at 86 passengers when departing from Singapore due to the humid conditions affecting the aircraft's performance. Okay. And you know, guess what? It doesn't change the cost any. You got a narrow window. You're not making a lot of money on this thing. Yeah. So this is super exciting. Uh, Singapore Air launches a global advertising campaign in December of 77 telling the world that, that Sing Air has gone supersonic, right? And that was like, they were very excited to be, to be doing That's this. That's cool. Yeah. And this was the part that got me so interested in this story and talking about the Concorde. Part of the agreement between Singapore and British Airways was to operate the Concorde in dual livery. So one side said Singapore Airlines on the left side and the right side said British Airways and they had different colors and different schemes, which I think is sure. awesome. Yeah. Now it's even better for Sing Air because what side you board the plane on, right? And at the time you used it in, in Singapore, you used roll up staircases. So it just looked like a Sing airplane, but you always board it on the left side. You never board on the right side. You always board on the left side. Yeah. So you would just see, you would just look like a Sing Air plane, right? Which I just think is, is great. They're like, oh, well, yeah, sure. The other side says BA, but nobody sees it. Prior to the start of the route, 
there's a disagreement between the British Airways and a small group of the the um, Concorde pilots who are to be stationed in Singapore over the terms and conditions of their detachment. So like before this thing even started, it already looked like it was going to be delayed. They figured that out. Great. Then at the 11th hour, okay. fucking December 7th, so a couple days before the first flight, the Malaysian government threatened to hold back overflight routes for the new service. Malaysia had presented no real reasoning for this. They just said, we don't want you to do this. The day before the inaugural flight was due to depart, literally the day before, the Malaysians formally refused all overflight permission for the Concorde, subsonic or supersonic. They're like, wow. you're not flying this over our airspace. You're not flying over us. Yeah. yeah. What they said was when, when Britain first approached um, Kuala Lumpur earlier that year for permission to fly over Malaysia, they contemplated service would have been wholly British. But sources said that the Malaysian objections crystallized when BA and Singair agreed to operate the flight jointly. We want nothing to do with those Singaporeans. Exactly. So the Malaysians are standing firm. The Singaporean government struck a last minute deal with Indonesia for the aircraft to route slightly further south than originally planned through Jakarta's airspace. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. The route was saved. The inaugural flight took off. And you know, even it looked like it wasn't going to, it was going to have to be postponed. They made it work. They had to lower their passenger counts even more. Only 90 passengers could be accommodated instead of the planned 100 on the way in due to the additional fuel required to take the longer routing. So they had to knock 10 people. So 10 people got bounced off that first flight oh, yeah. to come in. And then instead of 86 on the way out, you can only have 70 on the way out. It wasn't great that they found this alternate routing, but whatever. They found some, some alternate routing. It's expensive. But there was a problem. <laughs> I find this fascinating. On December 12th, so this is the day of the second Concorde departure from Singapore back to London. So they've done one round trip. Uh-huh. They've had one plane come back in. They're now ready to leave to go back. They found a new hiccup. Indonesia's overflight permission for the aircraft was only valid for one week. They did a one week deal and nobody bothered to be like, well, we should probably, I don't know, extend that. <laughs> extend that. Sure. Should keep keep talks open. What the fuck happened? Now, Indonesia didn't wish, you know, they didn't want to upset relations with Malaysia. So they were like, yeah. eh, we don't really want to give you any more permission beyond those first couple services because we're afraid this is going to piss off our friends in Malaysia. So BA was like, okay, we have to strike a deal with Malaysia. They were not confident about this at all, right? So mm-hmm. Britain suggested a compromise, like an interim agreement. Seems like financially they needed to write them a check. Yeah, who uh, knows? Break a deal right? Like, what Malaysia? do you want? Yeah. Britain suggested a compromise, like this, quote, interim agreement for three months so that discussions could keep going. And uh, Malaysia said, just no. They're like, we're not going to do this. Uh, 16 passengers who boarded in London destined for Singapore were very unhappy when they were reaccommodated under first class subsonic flights. They had to cancel the segment, right? They're like, we can't do this. Sure. This goes on for a year. So for a year, you've got a BA plane that's half BA, half Singair flying around the world, just not the Singapore because they can't get into Singapore. And uh, Britain and Malaysia talk that doesn't really get anywhere. Where finally, on December 15th of that year, so a whole year later, they come up with an agreement. The decision was reached after a year-long study by Malaysia revealed, quote, no conclusive evidence that Concorde flights over its airspace would damage the environment. So Indonesia also granted the joint permission for the service to be reinstated. Oh, it's it's all damaging the sure. environment. That's not yeah, true at they all. They didn't tell you about how much money was in the bag. There's nothing about air flight that's environmentally right? friendly yeah. anywhere. January of 79, so the next month, Wednesday, January 24th of 1979, the first Singapore-London flight started to operate. And they released a, a joint statement uh, a couple weeks before saying that, that uh, this, you're going to love this, that flights would operate over Malaysia at subsonic speeds for only five miles and for less than two minutes in each direction. They basically okay. like called out the fucking Malaysian government and been like, sure. literally, it's going to be for two minutes. Like you're talking about two minutes of travel over your country or in your airspace. That was a nice little dig. The actual flight times from Singapore to London was about eight hours and 15 minutes plus a 50 minute stopover in Bahrain. So you had a total time of nine hour, mm-hmm. uh, five minutes. Flight times going the other way, London, uh, Singapore was eight hours and 20 minutes. So nine hours and 10 minutes with a stop, which is pretty awesome, right? Sub 10 hours. Still pretty yeah, great. Still pretty great. Yeah. There were a couple interesting incidents. One was in May of 80, 1980, a Concorde flight departing uh, on its way to Bahrain, because on to London, blew the roof off a family home. Oh my. Yeah. Singapore Airlines refused to pay for the damage, claiming British Airways was responsible. BA did not admit liability, but paid the family 500 Singaporean dollars. So around, around 700 bucks in today's, you know, US dollars. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. to, quote, help them out. Like, it's not going to get them a new roof. Like, 700 bucks? Like, you blew the roof off their house? You're it's in, nothing. I know you're right. losing money on this service, but still, that seems kind of... But how do you know if it was the left side of the plane or the right <laughs> exactly. side of which the plane engine that was blew it, it off? Can, Where's the liability? Did you see which side of the plane blew it off? I also thought this was interesting. In uh, July of that year, 1980, a British biz- businessman was stabbed in the head by another passenger. Oh, my word. On a joint PA Singair flight. Not a Concorde. The, the Singair cabin crew and other passengers restrained the woman who had been behaving eccentrically and did not know the man. He said, uh, I still don't know why she attacked me. I never saw her before. 
before in my life. Her descendants now fly everywhere. Uh, her, defend- her descendants now fly fucking Spirit Airlines is what they do. Let me tell yeah, you. Yeah, but nobody stabs you on in your head. They literally sell a no stabbing <laughs> section. There's a section. Yeah. It's like instead of more leg room, it's just no stabbing. And it's not even guaranteed. It's just like we do our best. It's a best effort no stabbing section. We're going to get a cease and desist from Spirit Air, aren't we? Yes, we are. On that same flight, right? So the guy that got stabbed in the head on that same flight, they, uh, on, I think it was on final approach into Singapore, a, bu- a flock of birds was ingested by two of the four engines. Hey. That's bad. And the passengers didn't know, but yeah. one of the engines was extensively damaged. They had to fly in a replacement from London which delayed the return service. So that's the thing about airplanes. Like when they fail, you can't just like fly them to the repair shop. Like you got to fly the fucking engine in to fix it. Despite the earlier agreement to continue the Concorde service by August, 1980, it became clear this was not working. Yeah. Load factors were down from like 57% the previous year, which seems incredibly low to me down to 50%. Passengers were complaining about the discomfort of the cabin compared to the first class seats on wide body jets. Concords had smaller seats and it was a much louder environment. So it wasn't really I- ideal for, for that long of a trip. Mm-hmm. Singapore air and British airways kept talking, but they were running at like a $20 million loss per year, right? It was equivalent to like 42 million Singaporean dollars or call it roughly 30 million US dollars today per year. Fuel prices were going up. Um, September 1980 was announced the Concorde service to and from Singapore be suspended effective November 1st. So they're just like, we're done. And then after returning from Singapore for the last time, which was on October 30th, uh, 1980, yeah. they removed the Singaporean livery and returned it to full BA. So British British Airways livery on both sides. They returned to service, uh, I think mainly to New York. Like that was the that one was where the they route, made other money. Yeah. So they went, it went back to New York, London service. Now that aircraft, that exact aircraft, granted it's got BA livery on both sides now, but used to the one that used to have the Singaporean air. Yeah. That aircraft is the one that's on display at the Intrepid Museum in New York, cool. which is pretty cool. And you can climb inside it and see it. And sure. um, I just think it's a pretty cool piece of history. That, that was the one, you know, that same body that flew back and forth to um, to Singapore. Can you get in the cockpit? You can. It looks like you can. It looks like you can, you can see cool. in the cockpit. You can see in the whole um, passenger section. It looks pretty cool. BA has also, you know, just, just running out this story. Yeah. BA has also done some pretty cool stuff. They've taken the seats out of the Concorde those uncomfortable narrow seats and they've put them in their lounges, some of their first class lounges in Heathrow. Why? Which I never noticed before. But Why would I want uncomfortable uh, seats? Yeah, exactly. I think it's, the picture I saw, it looked like they were um, at, on like a conference table. It looked like they put them like around a conference table if you're in like one of the conference tables. And I just think it's cool they kept some some heritage there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, you know, and you probably don't want to be sitting there for a long time anyway. It's a conference room. So, uh, super cool story. I loved seeing this, you know, this dual livery going back and forth. There is a lot more to talk about on this. I do think we should, assume people like this this segment yeah, yeah i do think we should talk about uh sonic booms and then these folks over at boom wh- which are working on the overture so these guys are based in colorado and they are looking pretty good i think mm-hmm. they're on track supposedly to have first commercial flight by like 2029 which is pretty nuts and pretty much everyone has ordered planes from them i think american united both have orders like legit orders in yeah. four planes this is going to be like 70 ish people i think they do mach 1.7 and they're supposed to be much quieter so the sonic boom right. is still felt you can't get around the sonic boom but it's a much much quieter sonic boom so i'd love to talk about that more on you insulate the cabin better no no quieter on the ground oh is that right yeah, yeah. no in the cabin you don't hear it you don't hear the sonic boom in the cabin you're ahead of it no i know you don't hear the boom but you hear the rumble of the, the engines oh yeah, yeah, yeah you quite, hear the quite a yeah, loud sure. flight you know i also think that's kind of a non-issue with noise canceling headphones give everybody a pair of bows and who cares in today's travel that like like cabin noise to me is a non-issue hmm. there's so many other ways to solve that so anyway so this is the concord i think it's fun stuff to to, to talk about and unlike you i think it's one of the sexiest planes ever made all right we have to get out of here but quickly before we do have you seen or read anything good this last week yes and uh loosely related to uh, my segment here last week the defense department's all domain anomaly resolution office the aaro which has got to be one of the best government names i've ever seen sure released a report detailing its review of nearly 80 years of reports on government offices and special access programs related to what they call unidentified anomalous phenomena or UAPs. Things we didn't understand. Yes. This is just a new term for unidentified flying objects. Basically shit where we're like, we don't know what that is. We got to figure it out. Yeah. But it's a lovely read because it's about 63 pages long. At every turn, it just confirms what Occam's razor has told me about UFOs and really all of life over the years, which is that the simplest explanation is usually the accurate one. Right. And on every one of these, they seem to take a pretty uh, painstaking approach to be like, no, that didn't happen. Yes, it was a weather balloon. No, that person wasn't actually there. You'd think they'd be more clever with the name. It should should be, it should come out to be like, huh? Question mark. <laughs> I, mean, I don't work on that a little bit. I, I think the name is pretty good. I love uh, UAP. What's 
that? You up? I don't know. Art Bell told me about this report, and he said, "Don't believe it." Yeah. He said, "That's what they want you to think." You got the ghost of Art Bell coming over, and the ghost of Art Bell is out there telling you smoking no. some cigarettes at your house. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I understand the desire to be- to want to believe. I also was an X Files fan back in the nineties. Sure. I also want to believe, but I also go, you know, it's probably easier to just go, no, that's not what happened. I think this is the right answer. I don't have a lot of experience with any any large number of people in government being able to actually keep a secret. Exactly. That's the other thing too. Generally, like, humans are not great at keeping secrets. It all gets out. And then there's like yeah. one guy who's four degrees away from the thing who's like, I touched an alien spacecraft. And they're like, no. Uh, no, you didn't. You touched a B-2 stealth bomber just happened to be under a fucking tarp. Like, not a big deal. <laughs> anyway, that was my read. I think you should read a couple pages of it. I think you'd find it super interesting. Um, how about you? What, what did you find? First, uh, I got to say, I love the podcast Decoder. Oh, yeah, of course. Nadia Patel is the best. He is so smart, so informative. And I work really hard to make sure this podcast is nothing like his, <laughs> yes, which is please. hard because I think his is close to perfect. Wait, you say you, you have to work hard to make ours not smart and not informative? I just do that naturally. <laughs> I had no idea you were working hard on that. I just wanted to sound like his. He's got sure. this great laid back pace and rhythm and whatever. I just want to make sure that because I like his so much that we sure. do our own thing. But his show is so good. Second, and this is why I bring up Dakota uh-huh. right now. Complexly, co-founder and YouTuber Hank Green flipped the tables on Nalay and did a one of a kind episode. He interviews Nalay and it is oh, awesome. great. You would be hard pressed to find someone who understands the big picture of what's happening in the tech world better than Nalay Patel. His high tech news website has survived and thrived when nearly all of its competitors have evaporated. And Hank Green gracefully slam dunks the assignment. If behind the scenes with one of the brightest minds in tech news is of interest to you, catch the Decoder podcast with special guest host Hank Green interviewing Nile Patel. It is excellent. That sounds great. What did you listen to it on? Antenna Pod? Well, yeah. Was it? I did listen. To, how did you know that? I did listen to it I on Antenna guess. Pod. No, look, yeah. that's usually your favorite. I mean, I, I plug. You're, you're 100% accurate. I, I, I figured you're stuck in that Android ecosystem. You know, I plug uh, Overcast every single every week. I love Antenna Pod, actually. I know. I'm, I'm, I kind of yeah. want to try it just to see if I'm missing anything. That is the episode. Thank you for joining us for all this nonsense. A truly terrible podcast from our awful company. Visit us on the web at nonsense.productions. I'm such a little. I'm Jeff Parker. If you like this program, please download, follow, subscribe, and like it. Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Antenna Pod, iHeartRadio, Spotify, My Favorite Overcast, wherever you may get your podcast from. Podcastindex.org, they have a list of all the apps that use their amazing podcast index. Special thanks to our floor director, A.I. Smithy. It's our first A.I. floor director, isn't it? It is. It's not funny. It's just really kind of terse. Gets the job done. It does get the job done. Well, hopefully they come for our job soon. We'll be every Thursday morning for more nonsense. Please join us. Support for nonsense comes from, uh, uh, no, no, uh, no.